The city of Posen, or Poznan, had, with one short interruption, been a part of the Kingdom of Prussia since the Second Partition of Poland in 1793. Initially, the Polish population of the city experienced a period of tolerance. King Frederick William III turned Posen into a Grand Duchy under his rule instead of a simple Prussian province. He promised to respect the Polish language and to grant the Poles a certain degree of political autonomy. In a royal acclamation to the Polish people, he said, You will be incorporated into my monarchy without having to deny your nationality. Your religion shall be used alongside the German one in all public negotiations and access to the public offices of the Grand Duchy, as well as to all offices, honours and dignities of my empire, shall be open to everyone among you according to my abilities. The Polish prince Antoni Henryk Radziwiłł, who held close ties to the Prussian royal family, became the governor of Posen. Under his rule, Polish remained the second language of administration, most Polish civil servants were allowed to remain, and the higher schools became an important centre for Polish culture. This era of tolerance was very short-lived, however. After the failed Polish uprising of 1830, Radziwiłł was deposed because his brother was one of the leaders of the uprising. The duchy lost a big portion of its autonomy, many Polish civil servants got replaced by German ones, and Polish as a language got gradually repressed. Under the new Oberpräsident, which is what the highest administrative official in any Prussian province was called, Eduard von Flottwell, Posen changed significantly. The city turned into a gigantic fortress with a series of forts, walls and trenches surrounding the city, making it one of Prussia's most important garrisons. In order to complete this project, thousands of German engineers, workers, officers, soldiers and civil servants were settled in the area. Over the years, the German presence made itself very clear. After another failed uprising in 1848, Posen was demoted to a simple Prussian province like any other. After 1848, violent uprisings against the Prussian rulers finally ceased to exist. Many Polish patriots either accepted the current status quo or hoped that the other German kingdoms might potentially support an independent Polish state. When the formation of a united German nation, however, became a very possible reality in the 1870s, many Poles disapproved. After all, if the Germans had the right to create their own state, why shouldn't we? All the Polish members of the Prussian Landtag protested and demanded that the majority Polish parts of Prussia should be treated as a separate enclave. As you might expect, their voices were ignored as Germany became a unified state in 1871. After the founding of the empire, the Poles in Prussia's eastern provinces found themselves in a highly confrontational political situation against the Germans. In this time of nationalism and with the emerging mindset that certain cultures have the right to rule over others, conflicts and rivalries were pretty much inevitable, especially when Germanization measures began to be more frequently introduced and when the country was ruled by a chancellor who saw the Poles as sworn enemies and actively detested them. And nowhere were these cultural confrontations more frequent than in the city of Posen. Posen was the only province in which the Germans were a minority in total, even if they made up the majority in some towns and cities. Fascinatingly, the Polish population managed to create their very own national self-conscience amidst the ever-growing segregation laws. There are many reasons for that. Firstly, in the 1880s a huge number of German speakers left the economically backwards area in favour of the empire's western lands, or for the United States, while the Poles largely decided to stay. Secondly, the idea of organic work grew in popularity, which suggested that rather than getting killed in pointless uprisings, the Poles should instead strengthen the area's economy and embrace their culture. Thirdly, Prussia more or less shot itself in the foot with its discriminatory education laws. Since 1876, German was the sole language used in higher schools, which significantly lowered the amount of Polish secondary school students. In Posen, elementary schools were also strictly held in German since 1873, with the only exception being four to five hours of weekly religion and church singing class. In 1887, Polish language classes were completely abolished, under the pretext that the Poles would profit a lot more if they just spoke German all day. Seven years later, even private Polish classes were completely forbidden by the Minister of Education, Robert Bosse. Instead, pupils in high schools could now visit Polish classes again, but only for one to two hours per week, and if the school specifically requested for it. 
These measures were supposed to reduce the usage of Polish in daily life and to turn the Polsener Poles into proper Germans. Instead, however, educational and cultural associations popped up everywhere. For example, the women's association Warta secretly organized private Polish classes despite the ban. Then there was also the Society of Friends of Learning, which considered itself to be a replacement for the city's missing university and held very close contacts with other Polish centers of learning, such as Kraków and Lwów. So, ironically, those repressive measures actually fostered the growth of a Polish intelligentsia. Those developments deeply worried many Prussian authorities. Johannes von Mikkel, the vice president of the Ministry of State, declared during a session in February of 1898 that Paulsen is in danger of becoming a Prague for us. Now what did he mean by that? Prague, which also had a sizable German minority at the time, was ruled by a Czech mayor, and since 1888 all members of the city councils were Czechs. Mikkel feared that the growing and increasingly self-aware Polish middle class could, one day, potentially, dominate the cultural and political life in Paulsen, even if recent developments showed that this was nowhere near the case. This fear was further propagated by the nationalistic and openly chauvinistic German Eastern Marches Society. Ferdinand von Hansemann, one of the society's founders, wrote in the Posner Zeitung, The development of the last decades has put an end to the former economic superiority of the German bourgeoisie in Posen, as well as in most cities of the province. It has organized the consumption of the Polish population, as well as Polish production, and has thus enabled Poles to derive incomparably greater benefits from all the economic advantages of a general nature, i.e. in the fields of education, transport and intellectual stimulation, than is possible for Germans who are in economic decline. Precisely because of that fear, the mayor of Polsen, Richard Witting, proposed a plan to completely modernize and elevate the city to a higher status. Sounds great, but he had other intentions in mind. He wished to create an intelligent, economically strong and socially respectable German urban bourgeoisie. In order to achieve this goal, he proposed the construction of museums, libraries and monuments. The state ministry was thrilled by his ideas. The Prussian government had started a new strategy to increase the number of Germans in its eastern provinces anyway, and Witting's plan coincided very well with that. With the help of financial incentives, public servants, doctors, workers, educational associations, as well as evangelical clerics should be supported. Between 1897 and 1914, more than 25 million marks were invested into this questionable project. In May of 1898, a concrete plan for Paulsen was finally formulated. The city should receive a German association house, a hygienic institute, a museum and a library with exclusively German books. There were some critics of this idea who feared that those elevation measures might strengthen the numerically superior Polish population and that they might aid their cause. In the words of the politician Ferdinand von Hansemann, if the government lets the sun rise over Polsen, it shines over two Poles and one German. The government did not share the sentiment. Interior Minister Georg von Rheinbaben was convinced that the new city will be very profitable for the German population because of the superiority of German culture, German entrepreneurial and creative power and German capital. Before they could begin with their plans, two things had to be addressed first. Firstly, the surrounding municipalities of Jesitz, St. Lazarus and Wilder had to be integrated into Posen in the hopes that this might increase the total German population. It didn't, because their calculations were incorrect, but the incorporation happened anyway. And so, Paulsen's land area increased threefold and its population increased by about 50% to 115,000. Secondly, the fortification system that closely surrounded the city had to go in order to make some more space and to connect the outskirts with the city centre. In 1902, Paulsen was relieved of its status as a fortress and the fortifications were torn down. In 1904, a Royal Prussian Commission was tasked with planning how to proceed with the newly gained space. It was led by the very talented and famous architect Josef Stumm. Stumm had gained his reputation in Cologne, where he built the Ring Road on top of the former city walls in about five years. He also expanded the city of Koblenz and even gained multiple building contracts by the Belgian King Leopold II, who was known as Le Roi Bâtisseur, or the Builder King. As such, Stumm worked in Antwerp, Brussels, Liège, Tournai, 
Ostend, Leuven and many other Belgian cities. And now it was time for him to completely change the face of Posen. One part of the newly gained area was to become a new home for the Posenus, while the rest was reserved for representative monuments and parks. In the west of the city the Berlin Gate was demolished, in order to extend the St. Martin Street to the main station. Between 1905 and 1910, almost all of the planned representative buildings were built roughly where the old gate stood. Let's look at the most interesting ones, starting with the Royal Academy. Alongside West Prussia, Posen was the only province that did not have a university of sorts. However, when the construction of the Royal Technical University began in Danzig, Posen had to follow suit as well in order to avoid becoming an intellectual Siberia. Mayor Richard Witting quickly turned the opening of a new university into one of his life goals. His chances looked good, because he enjoyed Kaiser Wilhelm's complete trust and held close ties to him. However, he only partially agreed with Prussia's policy of colonizing the Polish lands with ethnic Germans, instead stating that it is vital to also make it easier for Poles to identify and sympathize with the German Empire. He suggested that an academic education could open up new career paths for Poles and enable their social advancement. With this assessment, he didn't gain a lot of friends. You see, at the same time in Berlin, the members of the Eastern Marches Society lobbied against the opening of the university. The German landowners didn't approve of an emerging academic class and they feared that this would only increase political instability. When it became clear that his plan had failed, Witting resigned from his position as mayor of Posen in 1902. Instead, the Royal Academy was opened by the Prussian state one year later. Paragraph 1 of the statute stated, the Royal Academy of Posen has the task of promoting German intellectual life in the Eastern Marches through its teaching activities and scientific endeavours. Against this openly polonophobic policy, Sigmund Florian Dziembowski protested in the Prussian Landtag. Because the Academy has set itself the task of merely promoting German intellectual life, the Poles see this as a kind of national insult, as if the minister had had a warning sign put up there, no admission for Poles. The academy wouldn't become a university until the city fell back into Polish hands in 1919. Next up is the headquarters of the Royal Prussian Settlement Commission. I'll make a whole video about the Settlement Commission later, so let's keep it short for now. The commission was founded in 1886 and its task was essentially to buy up Polish lands and to prepare them for the settlement of German farmers. The goal of the Prussian government was to slowly decrease the power of Polish landowners and to increase the German population. For that, the commission initially received 100 million marks, but it would receive even greater sums of money in the following two decades. Until 1918, the commission managed to settle about 158,000 Germans on a bit more than 300,000 hectares in total, which was, of course, nowhere near enough to make Germans a majority in the region. The exact country was the case even, and in total the share of Polish speakers and Polish-owned land increased. Despite its failures, the commission received a splendorous neo-baroque headquarters right next to the royal castle, which we will talk about next. After 1919, the building was given to the University of Poznan. Those two buildings stood at the representative Kaiser Forum, which included a huge square with an artificial lake, and the statue of Otto von Bismarck. There was also a theatre, a post office, two banks and the Protestant parish hall. The chef d'oeuvre of this forum, however, was obviously the magnificent imperial castle. Its construction began in 1902, at the direct order of Kaiser Wilhelm II himself, and its new residence would cost around 5.5 million mark in total. The goal of this gigantic castle was to show the local Poles that he was the one in charge. At the same time, the Kaiser followed the exact same strategy on the other side of the empire, in Alsace. There he ordered the reconstruction of the Hohe Königsburg near Oschweiler to demonstrate his power. The Posner Castle was built in the Neo-Romanesque style, which to Kaiser Wilhelm was THE most German style of architecture. The throne hall was ginormous and built like a Byzantine basilica. The castle's tower was 75 meters high and therefore the highest building in the entire city. In 1910 the construction was finally finished and the castle was festively opened by the Kaiser. 
In the end, however, this very expensive bulwark in the east turned out to be a waste of money. Kaiser Wilhelm almost never used it as a residence and it just stood there most of the time. In 1915 it was briefly used by the generals Ludendorff and Hindenburg as their headquarters and afterwards it got turned into a military hospital. When Posen became Polish again, the local Poles celebrated the capture of the castle as a symbolic victory over the Germans. They left it largely unchanged, only Bismarck was removed, the Prussian eagle on top of the tower was melted down and the cathedral was turned into a Catholic one. The Poznan University used the castle's ground floor for teaching and the Kaiser's former apartments became an official residence of the President of the Second Polish Republic. These impressive and quite honestly beautiful buildings can still be visited today. The University of Poznan is often regarded as one of the best in the country. Since the 1960s the Imperial Castle has served as a cultural centre and it includes a museum about the Poznan Uprising of 1956. Despite its, let's say, controversial history, the former Kaiser Forum is, in my humble opinion, the most beautiful part of the city with all the flowers, the spring fountain and because of the architecture. I highly urge you to visit Poznan one day and to really see all of these things for yourself. Alright, danke schön for watching. If you want to learn more about the history of Poznan and how it became a part of the Second Polish Republic, then click on this video. If you had a good time, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out a lot. A very big thank you goes out to my generous supporters over on Ko-Fi. A cup of tea, drinks and Tris and Kriegsmann. You are fantastic. Have a wonderful day and see you next time.